even though my heart may break. Welcome back. It is your home for Common Sense Radio. Every week we get a chance to talk with Brad Keithley, who comes in uh, to discuss uh, the state of affairs in the state of Alaska. Uh, unfortunately, it never really seems to be really great. We always It's always two steps forward, one step back. Now we've got our capital budget up there, and we've got other issues that are coming forward with the state of Alaska, including a potential for a new uh, oil tax and more. Brad Keithley comes on board to discuss it right now. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning, Michael. Are you suggesting I'm the doom and gloom portion of the, uh, you know, of the program? You know, it's, it's, it's always, I always love the segment, but sometimes I come away just so frustrated because it seems like we talk about the answers. You and I talk about the answers. We talk about the problems. We, we try and point, so we're always coming up with some kind of solution, and yet nobody, you know, nobody else seems to be getting it in Juneau. None of our elected politicians seem to be getting it in Juneau. And, and again, it goes back to what I've been saying lately, which is it is pure insanity to think that we can have the same people who got us into this mess, who had, who lacked the vision to understand, you know, to see where they were going with their actions. You know, the size and scope of government, the growth of government, the runaway spending. They could, they failed to see where it was taking them. Although a lot of us were crying from the rooftops, "Please stop!" And now they're the same ones who were saying, "Oh, don't worry, we can fix this. We'll take care of it for you." <laughs> I'm, I'm just not encouraged. And we, we can fix this by taking half by starting by taking half your PFD. Oh yeah, well, it's uh, the same. It's that like back, this, back to the government. It, right, it's like the same thing with Josh Walton. Well, we we got to control our spending, Josh. Yes. Well, we can get control of our spending. We just have to get more revenue before we control our spending. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> I I just I that does not compute. Yeah, it's not very Republican, is it? Well, it's it's just not very common sense. I don't even care if it's Republican or I mean, you're right, it's not Republican, but at the same time that makes that's like me saying, "Man, I'm just I'm blowing through money on these credit cards. I'm in a ton of debt, you know, but I got to get my spending under control." But uh, boss, I really need that raise. If you give me that raise, I can get my spending under control. I mean, who thinks that that would ever work in the real world, but that's the answers we're getting. Yeah, it's not not a very not a very satisfactory process that we've been embarked on, and we've been doing this since since about well, let's see, it was after Parnell got elected in 2010. The legislature in the early part of 2011, uh, he, he they kept it under control through the 2010 election, but then in the early part of 2011, it, they just started blowing up the budget, and uh, right. it was it was big capital spending, and then that sort of that sort of you know sort of got people's attention, the big capital spending. But what they were doing also was they were building up the operating budget while they were going along. So it's been it's been coming for a long time. Scott Goldsmith started talking about it, about the fact that we were building an unsustainable budget back in 2010, 2011. You could see it coming for a long time. Uh, and and people just said, oh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. And uh, and we just never have. So well, it's a it's a it's a continuing situation. Well, and you get to the point to where you start to wonder, um, are, are they just are, is are they being intentionally, you know, is it willful blindness or they do they just not get it? I mean, this thing with uh, we're going to talk about here to begin with the thing with Jason Gren, for example, it's like he, he put out this deal that you wrote about on your on your blog, Thoughts on Oil and Gas, talking about uh, the seven hundred million dollars in tax credits. Here's what the tax credits did for our state. Here's what we owe. Here's what we're we're we're, we're obligated to pay. And it's like. Do you not under are you you're a representative, you, you're an elected official supposedly in the driver's seat for us, and yet you obviously are either not understanding you've taken haven't taken the time to understand the details of it, or you are being willfully blind and you're misleading us. This I mean this is kind of the choices that we're left with as we look at our elected officials. Yeah, it's so so what what we've what we've had happen is is people built up the budget i mean legislators build up the budget in response to various special interest groups oh we need more capital spending so we get a uaa arena we get new engineering buildings at both the fairbanks and at and at uh, anchorage uh we get a new health services building a health sciences building at at anchorage um so we and and you know well we've got medic we've got all these federal dollars we could get if we just expanded medicaid and so we agree to spend additional state dollars to get some federal dollars in uh, on various on various programs, 
And all of that's in response to various constituency groups. Um, and so we get to the peak and we find out, oops, this is unsustainable. Uh, and now on the, as we're trying to deal with bringing the budget down, we still get the special interest groups, right? I mean, we still get right. people who are saying, oh, we can't, we can't cut this, we can't cut that, we can't cut the other thing. And, and Representative Grand's latest tweet or tweet from last week that I, that I wrote about this morning is just another one of those. Oh, we got to work. We got to look out for these oil and gas uh, uh, companies that have invested in the state, and we have this obligation uh, to, to to pay off uh, these companies. And we need to develop a plan to pay off these companies. Well, the statutes already provide a plan for paying off those companies. It's it's a plan that's been there since day one of the oil and gas credit program. And as that program has built up over time, and as the Credits have built up over time. People have decided, well, maybe we don't like that plan. We want to be paid off faster and then what that right. plan provides. So, so you have Representative Grin out there tweeting, oh, we need to develop a plan, uh, sort of skip over the part we already have a plan. We need to develop a, a new plan uh, to pay off uh, these oil and gas credits uh, faster, and they've produced all these results. Well, they haven't produced the results he claimed, and, and we, don't, we, we have a plan. We don't need to pay it off uh, any faster. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, that's a special interest, right? Oil and gas companies right. uh, who have built up, built up these credits want coverage and want, want, want a bigger share of the pie. You know, the same thing goes on with, with the, 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 the uh, K through 12 communities. Same thing goes on with the university com- community. Right. And we have all these, all these special interests that just want, you know, continued spending on theirs. Yes, we need to cut spending overall, but, but don't, don't cut our piece of the pie. <laughs> and then you have representatives and senators who all, you know, sort of, you know, deal with the special interests or, or get captured by one or another of these special interests and, you know, take the position. And it's just it's, it's a mess trying to get well, this, and, trying to get, you know, this back under control. Right. Well, and this is a bipartisan problem. We got people in the Senate saying the same kind of thing. Oh, well, we really need to pay these things. We have a statutory. It's already written in law. Again, you you, you mentioned it. It seems like, oh, we got to come up with a plan. The plan is already written in law. And these oil companies went into this eyes wide open. I mean, you talked about the fiduciary responsibility of these oil companies and the lenders. They have, they, I guarantee you they've got a multitude of attorneys reading the fine print on these things, understanding that there was a nice-to-have and there was a must-have. The must-have was the statutory minimum. We're guaranteed you're going to get this. Everything else beyond that is a maybe. They knew that going in. I'm sorry. You know, they, they, they could spin it any way they want, yet we've got both the left and the right the House and the Senate, we've got we've got players in there that are all basically, oh, we've got to come up with a new plan. The plan is already there. Yeah, exactly right. And 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 you're exactly right about the lenders knowing that. I mean, so I, I get pushback from some that say, oh my gosh, the lenders are all all upset at Alaska. Can you imagine, you know, how, what they're going to think of Alaska if we don't pay these obligations back? It was in the statute. The payback obligation is in the statute. They read the statute. They knew what the payback obligation is. And essentially, the payback obligation said this. If the state of Alaska gets a lot of production tax revenues, if oil prices are high and we have a lot of production and we have a lot of production and we have a lot of revenues for production taxes, we'll pay you a fair we will we'll pay back at a fairly uh, hefty rate. And Alaska did that uh, as long as oil prices were high and, and production levels were up. Now that oil prices are down, the statute clearly says, hey, we have a right. limited obligation or declining obligation as oil prices go down. If we can't afford it, if we're not getting revenues in the door, we have a more limited obligation to pay revenues out to pay these, pay these back. It, it's a question of who took the risk. In these credits, it's a question of who took the risk on a decline in oil prices and a decline in, in oil production tax uh, revenues. And the statute was absolutely clear from the beginning that it was the oil companies and their lenders who were taking the risk of lower oil prices. Now that that risk has come home to roost uh, and we do have lower oil prices and we do have lower revenues, they want to change the rules of the game. They want a new plan right. uh, to, to yeah. increase those payments. And, and we just can't afford it. Uh, right. And, and to, have, to have legislators out there saying we need to develop this new plan – and, and, and the thing that really bothers me about Grin, to be honest, is he's doing that. He's out there saying we need to develop this plan to pay off these, quote, obligations 
an, an additional amount toward these obligations at the same time as he is one of the as he as he was one of those who voted to cut the PFD, an right. obligation well, to Alaska citizens. Well, that's the so, hypocrisy so, so, of it. And again, it's not just Gren. I mean, Gren is the most blatant one lately, but the senators did the same thing. The senators that voted yep. to cut into the PFD did exactly. It's the hypocrisy of, well, it's in statute. We've got to pay these and more. They wanted to pay 277 or $288 million more than what is statutorily required. But at the same time, it's in statute that they're supposed to pay out the PFD, and they decided none for you. Yeah, yeah. it's. I mean, the the, 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 oil and gas, the oil and gas credit obligation is here's a minimum. You may pay more. Essentially, the statute says you may pay more. Legislature, you may pay more if you want to. The, the, oil, the, the PFD statute says you shall uh, 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 deposit 50 percent of the earnings calculated in the way the statute provides, 50 percent of the earnings in the permanent fund dividend fund to be paid out by the permanent fund, uh, by, the, by the Department of Revenue Permanent Fund Division. You shall do that. So they cut that, and they cut the shall language. They say, well, it's not really an obligation. You know, it's just more guideline. We're going to cut it down to 25 percent. At the same time as, as Grin and others are out there, as, as you say, senators, are out there arguing to increase the payments to the oil companies. It's just, it's just it, we have been overwhelmed uh, in this state by special interests. We've been overwhelmed. And, and, and I come from the oil and gas industry. I mean, I, mean, I can right. sort of relate to these guys but 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 they've just joined the train of uh, we're a special interest we we want we want our you know we want a bigger cut for ourselves it's it's, we're not going to we're not going to get to a solution as long as we have legislators out there special pleading for this industry or that or or some other industry especially at the same time as they're cutting their obligations to alaska citizens right and not to drag too much libertarianism into this discussion, but this is the, this is what I've been preaching about for years. This is the problem with cronyism, with crony capitalism. This is the problem with kowtowing to the special interests because the special interests always end up winning out over the taxpayer, over the people, because they've got more time, they've got more money, they dedicate their entire existence to furthering their goals. And that's always the problem when you got government in there picking winners and losers is that the losers are almost exclusively – the taxpayers in the end. Yep, and 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 it's no more clear. I mean, absolutely crystal clear in this situation, where they've cut the PFD uh, by fifty percent from what the statute clearly provides uh, is is due to Alaska citizens. I mean, so so some of them will say, "Oh, but we're trying to change that statute." Yeah, but you haven't. Uh, right. uh, you've been prevented from doing that by votes by by various votes and and various. Uh, 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 decisions of, of people. So you haven't changed the statute, and as long as you haven't changed the statute, can you can you imagine what the oil and gas industry would be doing legitimately if if the legislature said, "I know we owe you that minimum that's provided in the statute, calculated according to the statute, but we're not going to pay that. We're going to cut right. that by fifty percent because because we just sort of feel like it." Um, yeah. Can you imagine the outcry of the oil and gas statute? And they would have a legitimate claim. Their lenders right. would have a legitimate, legitimate claim. The companies who had earned those credits would have a legitimate claim. But that's exactly what the legislature has done to Alaska's families. They have said, yeah, we know we owe you that uh, under the statute. We know that's what the not only what the policy says but what the strict letter of the law says. But we're just going to ignore that and cut your payment by 50 percent. It, it's, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, by gosh. You know, if you're well, going to if you're going to talk a lot about all these obligations you have to oil companies, by gosh, you better be talking about your obligation to Alaskans as well, because they we we are as deserving as as the oil companies are. Right. Well, it is it, the same legitimacy you just talked about should apply on the Alaska side. It is in statute. It is in statute that this is what you're supposed to pay. Well, subject to appropriate. Again, if you had a governor that vetoed half the payout to the oil company. There would be, a, again, a legitimate loss. Is it any different because it's corporately the people of the state of Alaska versus corporately an oil company? It, it's not. And if you, had, if you had a legislature that said, I know what our contracts with the, with the, the, the government employee labor unions provide, we're only going to pay half of those. I know what our contract was with, to, for you to you know, build this building, we're only going to pay half of that. I know what I know what. Uh, 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 what we agreed to fund toward uh, toward the 
uh, K through 12, but we're only going to pay half of that. If the legislature or governor did any of that, there would be this huge outcry from that special interest. But that's exactly what they've done to Alaska citizens by cutting uh, the PFD in half, uh, uh, un- uh, uh, contrary to the statute. And it's a la- exactly what they've done to the overall Alaska economy. We're in a recession. ICER has said the largest adverse effect on the overall on on the overall economy of all of the things you can do in terms of new revenues is to cut the PFD. The largest right. adverse effect on income of anything you can do is to cut the PFD. Yet they've done that. So it, and, and repeated I mean, <laughs> repeated uh, two, two years. I mean the governor. Yeah. The governor did it, and then, but the legislature didn't override it, and now the legislature is doing it this year. Yeah, it's, right. it's been repeated. So they're undercutting the Alaska economy. They're undercutting Alaska families, uh, and then they're going out you know, crying about, well, we've got to meet our obligations to, to oil companies. We've got to develop this new plan to meet our obligations to oil companies. Just I, the, the, <laughs> the, the oil companies are being their own worst enemies when they do that. I mean, we're going to talk in the second half about you know, a, a, a potential drive to, to have an initiative ballot for increased oil taxes. The oil companies are being their own worst enemies uh, by right. going out there and, and special pleading for additional monies um, uh, for, for these oil tax credits at the very time that the legislatures they've got out there, the legislators they've got out there doing that pleading have voted to cut the PFD, have voted to cut their obligations right. to Alaska's families uh, and, and the overall Alaska economy. Just, just – I. It's just very hard to articulate uh, how frustrating uh, that is to, to someone who cares about the overall Alaska right. economy and cares about the impact on overall Alaska families. Final thought really quick. $77 million is what we're supposed to pay. We're hearing they may put $700 million back in. Your thoughts on a capital budget that includes $700 million included for that and not for a, a full funding of the PFD? Vote no on the capital budget. Cut, shut down the capital budget. If they try to fund any more than the statutory minimum for oil and gas tax credits, vote no on the capital budget. All right. We're going to be right back. Thanks, Brad. Hold on one second. The Michael Duke Show. Every Tuesday, Brad Keithley is our guest. We get a chance to talk about all the things that are important uh, in the state government, the budgets, oil, gas, politics, and more. He continues now into our second segment where we get a chance to delve down into this discussion about a citizen-sponsored initiative in changing the oil and gas tax structure. Now, I'm for the citizens' initiative and referendum process. I am a little troubled, though, about creating tax structures under that because usually they are so complex. We'll see what Brad has to say about that. Brad, good morning. Thanks for coming back. Absolutely, Michael. Thanks for having me. So so what's your read? I mean, I, I know it's a little hypocritical to say I'm for the initiative process, but I don't want the tax structures to be created on it. It's uh, it, it's it's tough, but I, I think I've got to take a stand on that. Well, I mean, you can be for init- the initiative process as a, as a generalized proposition because sometimes it's useful. Frankly, I wish at times that we'd started one on, on controlling spending uh, back yeah. in, uh, in 2012 or 2013. Uh, but that doesn't mean all initiatives are good. It just means it's good to have good to have the process around. And I think I, your instincts are right uh, with respect to an initiative on oil and gas taxes. Oil, the, the, what we need to do when we develop oil and gas taxes, what any producing region needs to do when it thinks about oil and gas taxes, is it needs to find the point, needs to spend time finding the point uh, where you can you can take taxes, take, uh, have government take of, uh, from the industry, but, not, but stay short of the tipping point where if you add additional taxes, you start tipping investment in that region someplace else. You raise the cost of producing in that region so high that investment goes someplace else. That is a particularly important uh, issue right now uh, in the oil and gas industry, because with low oil prices, uh, investment is scarce. There's been a couple of recent reports uh, about how low investment levels are in the industry right now, and and if uh, and if Alaska Alaska has done pretty well uh, in terms of maintaining its share and in fact actually increasing its share of investment 
uh, a little bit as a result of SB 21. That's resulted in increased production, increased development uh, that we've seen in the state. And we've seen rising production levels now the last two years uh, as a result of that. So we're, we're, we're doing pretty well with uh, uh, on staying short of tipping ourselves over. But anytime you mess with taxes, you, that's, that's, the, that's the overriding consideration. Don't push yourself past the tipping point and start running investment uh, out of the state. Finding that tipping point, uh, believe me, I've, I've spent you know, 35 years around the industry on, on these sorts of issues. Finding that t- tipping point is an extremely time-consuming, uh, information-intense, uh, thought-intense, uh, work-intense uh, uh, process, uh, and one where you need experts and one where you need to think about what you're doing and you need to think about different uh, tax approaches, um, uh, developing different tax approaches to make sure you stay short of that tipping point, just short, but short of that tipping point. Right. All of those things are, th- are things that n- – none of those things are things that, that, that lend themselves well to the initiative process, right? The initiative right. process is sort of a blunt end instrument right. that says, it's a hey, legislature, we – It's a, sl- it's a yeah, sledgehammer exactly. instead of a scalpel, right? Exactly right. It's, you're, you're saying, hey, legislature, we don't like what you're doing, so bam, here's a, here's a solution we're going to impose on you. Um, and it's, it's more the result of what you can capture voters' imagination on uh, as it is – as opposed to being a, a fine scalpel – uh, approaching, you know, finding where that tipping point is. So, I, I'm concerned about going down down the road of this oil and gas initiative. Now, frankly, yet given the conversation we had in the last segment about about the about this press for more and more and more uh, toward right. the oil and gas uh, tax credits, more and more cash, I understand why people are are thinking about an initiative. I mean, it, to to some degree, frankly, the oil and gas industry has become a special interest and is looking out for itself and trying to grab more money away at the very time we're cutting the PFD, trying to grab more cash away uh, for the industry, uh, saying the industry is more important, frankly, than Alaskans. I mean, that's the message you get out of Jason Grin's uh, tweet. Uh, we have to worry about, uh, you know, paying our, quote, these obligations to our to the oil and gas uh, uh, companies uh, at the same time as we're cutting uh, PFDs and, and hurting the Alaska the overall Alaska economy, I understand the 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 the, the impetus behind thinking about doing an initiative. Initiative. Uh, I understand the motivations. I understand the emotion. I understand sort of the pushback that people feel against an industry that 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 at least in this instance looks like they're trying to overreach. Um, but we have to be careful. <laughs> we we. You, you can't just you can't operate on emotion in these things. You have to look at what's in the best interest of the overall Alaska economy, and keeping Alaska short of that tipping point, keeping Alaska short of of adopting a policy, oil and tax policy, that starts running investment out of the state uh, elsewhere is something that's just overridingly hugely important to our economy, uh, and isn't something that we ought to be playing around with through an initiative process. Let's talk. Uh, let's talk for a second, though, about the specifics of what they're proposing. I mentioned earlier that part of the problem that I see uh, with some of the tax structures in the state of Alaska is there is a, a considerable amount of complexity in it. And one of my assertions has always been, you know, if you're an oil company, you've got an entire floor somewhere of sharp penciled accountants who are finding yep. every you know, legal or quasi legal, you know, loophole write off saving. They're going to I mean, they're going to they're going to labor all year on the tax return and submit it. Uh, and and it's going to be as complicated, as as complex as it can be, because the Department of Revenue has got a handful of audit accountants that can go through this stuff. And there's a finite window at which the state of Alaska can go back and review and audit tax returns before they fall off. And there's a statute of limitations, essentially, on it. Right. And we know that they just can't keep up with, you know, you can't keep up. with. You've got one company with 30 accountants who are who are massaging this return. And you got four accountants at the state of Alaska taking not just that one companies but dozens of companies returns it it makes it very difficult the complexity of a net profits kind of situation becomes very difficult is there an argument for a kind of a gross production tax versus a net profits tax there there is an argument for it but you've got to be careful and and this is where this is why tax systems become 
become complex. The, the problem with the gross is, is as prices decline, uh, yes, the gross declines, but the margin, the, the margin that the companies are left with is, is being squeezed harder and harder and harder. Um, a net profits tax sort of, sort of takes a chunk of the profits that come out of the industry, and as the profits decline, it reduces the amount of profits they're taking, but there's still some profits and still some incentives for industry to continue investment. If you do a gross profits tax, you can fairly easily at low prices, depending upon what the level of the, of the, of the gross take is, what the percentage is, you can fairly easily wipe out all profits. And, and so what you, do when you, what you do when you do that is to re, is, is, is hit the tipping point and you're, you're tipping dollars, investment dollars, out to other regions that do have net profits taxes and are permitting the, the, the companies to at least continue to achieve some profits, even at low prices, um, where you've wiped those out in a gross profits tax regime. The, the way to approach that, if you want to do gross profits or the gross revenues, the, the way you do that is you then have to carve in exceptions that say at lower prices, the, 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 the percentage reduces or in some fashion try to adjust that tax so that as you get to low prices, you nevertheless still leave a profit margin that is, reflect, that, that is competitive with what they're going to earn in investing in, uh, in other regions. And, and so you introduce the same sort of complexity uh, into the system as, as, as you try to do that as you do in a net profits tax uh, in the first place. Um, so it's, simplicity always sounds great, and certainly you want to make it as simple as you can. And frankly, SB21 probably introduced a couple of things that make, make our tax system more complex than it needed to be. Uh, but all of those are in response to various uh, concerns about are you pushing this over the tipping point uh, if you don't, you know, have a carve out uh, in in this situation for uh, for what happens in this situation. Um, right. So I, yeah, you can get there, but but it actually at the end of the day it probably becomes as complex as what we've got now. So again, the problem. Uh, I mean, it, it, does any good come out of uh, having a citizens' initiative on oil tax, whether it passes or not? I mean, is there any is there any point in furthering the discussion? Does does anything good come out of that? I I, I honestly, I mean, it, it expresses the it, it provides an opportunity to express the frustration, and and discussions like uh, Nat Hertz reported in the ADN about the discussions that have started around the citizens' initiative. Uh, and 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 other efforts regarding that is, is a good is is a way of expressing citizens' frustration with what the legislature is doing, uh, and expressing a concern and saying, look, if you guys can't get your house in order, then we're going to consider you know the blunt force instrument, um, uh, using the blunt force instrument to to try to get it in order. Um, I think I think what that does it needs to generate the legislature going back. Uh, as, as they proposed to do with this task force that they set up under, under HB 111, the, the oil tax bill they just passed, to go back, take a look at our tax structure, and frankly be very open and transparent about, about where, why that, or how that tax structure relates to the tipping point. Are we short of the tipping point? If we're, if we're, if we're well short of the tipping point, are there things we can do uh, uh, to improve our tax structure, but still not take us over the tipping point? Are we at the tipping point under the current tax structure? It needs to generate this initiative, I think, can help in, in, in or this discussion about an initiative can help generate a discussion about what we need to do. I just am very concerned if we, if we go to the point of actually having an initiative and then voting on it uh, uh, in, the, in the 2018 election, I think that will send us down the wrong direction. Well, the initiative process may be the only thing we can do to change what's broken in the in the current state of uh, in the current state of affairs with the state of Alaska. Uh, we've talked about that changing the venue, changing the uh, changing the the function, the funding mechanism, changing the rules so that they have to all play by the same set of rules. Uh, they're getting kind of cagey now. They're now they're not putting things into law. They're just funding things through funding mechanisms. And uh, so they're getting a little cagey about it. I think they see the handwriting on the wall. We'll have to see what happens with that. Uh, Brad Keithley, thoughts on oil and gas. You can find his blog online. Uh, Brad, I really appreciate you coming on. Thanks, as always. A a tough stuff, but good to know. I appreciate you being part today. 
Thanks for having me, Michael. As always, my pleasure.